Kathy Wood was a notorious pathological liar, but when she approached her husband and confessed that she had become a serial killer, he had a feeling that she was telling the truth this time. With the help of her new girlfriend, Kathy had murdered five people in a twisted bonding pact. They even turned the murders into a game, choosing their victims so that their initials would spell out a message. Kathy and Gwen are infamously known as the lethal lovers for taking so many innocent lives as a date night activity. But when the lovers turned against each other at the last hurdle, would either of them get away with their crimes? Before we get into the case, I want to thank our friends at Ritual for sponsoring this video. I have tried a bunch of multivitamins in my time, so I feel like I'm quite well qualified to know what's good and what's not. And my latest favourite is the Essential for Women multivitamin from Ritual. I've actually told you guys about these vitamins before. I've been using them since the start of this year and I love them. And I love the company behind these multivitamins as well. Ritual are very passionate about making their products and the ingredients in their products traceable for their customers. They want to be very transparent about where they're getting things from, why they're putting each thing into their product and what that's gonna do for you. I think multivitamins are so important because even with a balanced diet, there's always gonna be natural gaps in your nutrition intake. So I always take a multivitamin just to help to bridge those natural gaps. The Essential for Women vitamin is designed to support your foundational health. So that's your brain, your bones, your blood, antioxidant support. They even have slow release technology, which basically delays the vitamin from being absorbed by your body until it reaches the small intestine, which is optimal for vitamin absorption. Absorption? Yeah. I feel like that's a word. They're non-GMO, gluten-free, major allergen-free, and they're also vegan-friendly. So that's a win for all you herbivore babes. To start a daily ritual that you care about, visit ritual.com forward slash 30 eneal for 30% off of your first month. Thanks again to our friends over at Ritual for sponsoring this video. One last thing before we get into the case, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. Everything that I'm about to say is publicly available available information that myself and my team have found on the internet and we have compiled into this one video. This video will cover especially sensitive topics including, but not limited to, the abuse and murder of vulnerable people by their carers, self-harm, domestic abuse and violence, animal abuse, sexual assault and threats of suicide. If you feel like these topics might be triggering or too intense for you then I'd recommend that you click out of this video now. Hopefully I'll get to see you some other time with a different case that's a bit more suited to you. Look after yourself in the meantime. And while we make every effort to fact check our sources and make sure all of our information is correct, no action should be taken in reliance upon the information in this video. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you all that these are real people's lives that we're talking about, so please keep it respectful in the comment section, keep it kind. All opinions in this video are mine and mine alone, and with all of that being said, Let's get into the case of the Lethal Lovers. So today's case takes place in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1987 at a care home named Alpine Manor. It was a residential nursing facility for the elderly and disabled, basically anyone that needed a high level of support and live-in care, they would go to stay at Alpine Manor where there's nurses and there's nurses aides to look after them, people to make them meals and give them medication. The majority of the residents at Alpine Manor had Alzheimer's or dementia and they were pretty much entirely relying on the staff at Alpine Manor to meet every single one of their needs. Like I said, Alpine Manor was staffed with a mixture of nurses and nurses aides. Now, the difference between those two is that nurses are nurses, <laughs> they've been to like medical school and everything, whereas nurses aides are usually unlicensed people, just individuals who work under the care of no, under the provision of these nurses to be able to give care to people. So they're not like qualified nurses, but they can do certain things when they've got an actual nurse present, you know? My auntie actually does that kind of job. She's not a nurse. She's never done like medical school or anything, but she can go out to these people's homes and make sure they've had their medication, cook them some dinner, make sure that they're all ready for bed, you know, help them get changed, help them 
you know, just normal human tasks that some people might find very difficult, whether that's due to their mobility or their memory or anything like that. And also a big part of being a nurse's aide is to just fill uh, people's social needs because especially, I guess less so for like residential facilities, but especially those that have nurse's aides come to their house, it can be quite lonely. So a nurse's aide is also just there to have a chat and bring some sunshine into people's lives. And nurses' aides were at the heart of Alpine Manor. They really kept that ship running smoothly. It was a large portion of the workforce in that residential place. And a lot of the women were just like, a lot of them were women <laughs> in their early 20s, mid 20s. And a lot of them were actually romantically involved with each other. After work, they would all head off into the town and visit the gay bars and get drunk and end up hooking up with their co-workers. They would all be in like flings with each other and like swap around with it. Um, and somehow the whole town knew that this was a thing. Like Alpine Manor was kind of notorious for its lesbian workforce. In fact, a journalist described it as a covey of lesbians. And the reason I tell you all of this is because two of these lesbian nurses aides are at the center of our case today. 23 year old Gwen Graham and 24 year old Kathy Wood. Both of these women came from troubled backgrounds, which is actually their main reason for ending up at Alpine Manor. They'd both left their homes and their families and their state that they were born in, and they had found themselves picking up a job here. The two of them started off as just friends, of course, when they both started working at the care home, but after a few outings with the other girls, Kathy and Gwen quickly became more than friends. And more than friends very quickly developed into a codependent relationship. Both women were quite unstable without each other. And this was both inside work and outside of work. They would try to pick up the same shifts as each other. They both worked night shifts. Um, so that they could be together at work and then outside of work they would go to bars together and then stay together in the same house and wake up together and do stuff together during the day and then go to work. Like they had very quickly fused their lives together. And this toxic relationship that they had, call it what it is, codependency is toxic. And the two of them would argue quite a lot because they're in each other's pockets. They were getting at each other a lot. And this toxic relationship started to bleed over into their work life. Their co-workers were noticing it. And very soon, it wasn't just the two of them that it was affecting. Their relationship would soon have fatal consequences for their patients too. So I wanna start by looking at the women's past and their upbringing and what brought them to Alpine Manor. I think it's all very important to know kind of the mindset of these two women when it got to the murders. So we'll start with Kathy, the older of the two. She was born Catherine Wood on March 7th, 1962 on a military base in Washington State because her father was in the military all her life. Her mother was a stay-at-home mother who cared for Kathy and very soon a younger sister as well. The family were later stationed in Massachusetts and it was around that time that Kathy's father was sent out to fight in the devastating Vietnam War. He did survive his service, but when he returned to his family, he was a shell of the man that he once was. He had severe PTSD, but not only that, he had become very cruel like ab abusive, abusive to his wife, to his children, verbally, physically, emotionally. He was a cruel man now. The war had turned him into a bitter, horrible person. My dad, my dad was, he, he drank a lot, he was an alcoholic and he was abusive. So um, I stayed by myself most of the time. You say abusive, physically abusive? Yes, physically, mentally. Kathy found herself isolating from her whole family, pretty much, of course, her father. She didn't want to be around him. She tried to get away from him any chance that she could. She would just lock herself in a bedroom whenever her dad was home. And it also really affected her relationship with her mother as well, because her mother wouldn't stand up for the girls. Of course, Kathy and her little sister hadn't done anything wrong to their father, yet he would abuse them all the time and their mother would never stick up for them. So she lost a lot of respect for her mother and just didn't feel safe. She didn't feel protected in her own home. She felt as though her only ally was her younger sister. That was the only person in that home that she even felt comfortable to talk to. In fact, her sister later said that this 
in a sad way, did bring them closer together because they had this shared trauma that they could talk each other through. Growing up, of course, being sisters, we fought, we argued, we played pranks on each other, we laughed, we told secrets. And growing up in a dysfunctional family made us very close. And life wasn't much easier for Kathy outside of the home either. She was bullied at school relentlessly. She struggled to make friends. She used to just spend a lot of her time sat alone reading in the playground. And when Kathy reached like puberty age, early teens, her father became even more cruel. He would ridicule her in absolutely every way that he could, especially relating to her physical appearance and how it was changing. Whether it was her height, her weight, her proportions, her face, he would just make fun or pick at her for everything, saying that she was plain and that boys her age are not gonna want her. This damaged her self-esteem terribly before she'd even started dating, before she'd even thought about it. But then at the age of 14, she did get into her first relationship. She told her parents that she had a boyfriend called David and she would go and see him all the time at his house. He would never come to hers, of course, having a home life like she had. I wouldn't wanna bring my partner back to meet my family. So her family never really met David. Uh, Kathy would just always go to his after school or on weekends. And I believe her parents were fine with that. That was until one day, in about a year and a half into this relationship, they were together for a long time with Kathy and David. Kathy's mother goes to pick her daughter up from David's house. When she gets there, she knocks on the door and David's mum comes to the door and she's like, hi, I'm, I'm Kathy's mum. I'm here to pick up my daughter. She's been hanging with David all day. Um, and David's mum looked very shocked at what Kathy's mum had just said. And she was like, what? Like, my daughter's here. She's going out with your son. Like, and that was when David's mother said that she didn't have a son called David. She didn't have a son at all. The person that Kathy had been hanging out with at their house for the last year and a half was her daughter, Debbie. Upon finding this out, Kathy's mother went absolutely ballistic. She was so angry with her daughter that she forbid her from ever seeing Debbie slash David ever again. Of course, Kathy put up a bit of a fight. I mean, she'd been with Debbie slash David for the last year and a half. And obviously there was a connection there. So she was begging her parents to just like calm down and try and listen and understand the situation, but they wouldn't. And they even threatened to throw her in a psychiatric hospital if she kept this relationship going. Kathy tried to tell her parents that she had no idea that David was a girl. She said that she had been going out with a boy called David for the last year and a half and that he was a boy and they had had sex. She lost her virginity to David and it was a penis that had penetrated her. She was sure of it and she told her parents that. She said that Debbie must have just been dressing as a boy every time that she met her. You know, just like tying her hair back, putting a cap on, wearing boys clothes and acting as a boy, calling herself David all to trick Kathy. That was, that was how she kind of explained this to her parents that like, not only do you feel um, like you've been fooled and lied to, so do I, imagine how I feel. This is my boyfriend that has turned out to be biologically a girl. She managed to actually convince her parents that this was the case, that she had no idea that David was a girl and that she had been dating a boy called David or what she thought was a boy for the last year and a half. Um, and she was just as shocked and heartbroken and devastated as her parents were. Now, a lot of people, including Kathy's own younger sister, don't think this is the case. They think that Kathy is lying. Kathy later is proven to be a pathological, compulsive liar, and it seems that she had been all the way through her life. The most believed theory is that Kathy was knowingly in a lesbian relationship with Debbie. She was attracted to girls even as a young teenager and this was like her first proper relationship and she knew that her parents would have a problem with it, with, with her partner being a, a woman. So she decided to lie and say that she was dating a boy just to, you know, not cause these kind of issues. Hence why they only ever met up at David's house or outside of the home. Of course she wasn't gonna bring Debbie back to 
her mum and her dad. Kathy always likes to paint herself to be the victim of every single situation that she is in. Um, and even though she is somewhat of a victim here of homophobic, unreasonable parents, but what she is not believed to be a victim of is catfishing. Would you call that catfishing? Even her own younger sister and people that knew Kathy in her life don't believe that she thought she was dating a boy for a year and a half. This was all a story that she had come up with to cover this up. Of course, we don't know the full truth and it's kind of only really Kathy's word against everyone else's theory. Um, and honestly, I don't suppose it matters too much to the case at large, so moving on. Her next relationship began when she was about 16, 17 years old and she met a 20 year old man named Ken Wood, who was the polar opposite of Kathy in pretty much every single way. She was quite a rebellious, unruly teen. She was very outgoing. She liked to she liked to get herself in some trouble, a little bit of trouble. But he couldn't be less like that if he tried. He was calm, he was easygoing, he was sensible, he had his life together. And most importantly, he seemed to really, really adore Kathy Wood. They had a very whirlwind, romancy first couple of months together, and very quickly, young Kathy fell pregnant with his child. And they very hastily made the decision to keep the baby and to get married so that they wouldn't have the child out of wedlock. Like, as soon as she fell pregnant, that was it. That was their lives sorted and concreted for them. After just eight months of knowing each other, they were living together, planning their wedding, and Kathy was almost ready to pop with their baby. She spent the rest of her pregnancy in different like parenting classes, especially teen pregnancy classes, and she would spend a lot of time with her own mother just to kind of learn a thing or two about motherhood and having children. Um, but at this point in her life, her mother had just been growing more and more and more bitter towards her as she'd been growing up and I guess becoming an attractive young woman. At this point, she was like 17, 18. She would have had a womanly figure. She would have had a beautiful face. And I think her mother was very, very insecure about that. She was one of those jealous mothers that saw her daughter as competition in some weird way. Um, but realistically, she'd never been very nice to her daughter. I think another big element of why she was so resentful of Kathy is because she'd managed to escape their abusive home. Her mother was stuck at home with her father, who was a horrible, cruel man. And maybe her mother looked at Kathy and thought she was so lucky to have gotten away from him and to have her own life with her own man and, you know, a, a wedding and a baby. I think she was just jealous of her own daughter in a lot of ways and she couldn't deal with that. Throughout her pregnancy, Kathy's mental state declined very quickly. And I mean, it had never been in a good place to begin with due to her horrific home life and, and of course the, the tumultuous breakup and separation from her first ever relationship. And the bullying at school, she was also quite a loner, couldn't make friends. All of this meant that she'd, she'd always been quite low, quite depressed, even as a child. But everything just seemed to get worse, worse and worse and worse continuously throughout her life. So at this point, of course she's married, but they're going through some realizations that maybe Kathy and Ken are not for each other. But at this point, it's kind of a bit too late, or at least they think it's too late. They're pregnant and due to have a baby, they're planning their marriage, like, to, in their minds, they can't go back on this. So now they're stuck together forever and they're not entirely happy. That was due to get worse, by the way. At this point, they were just realizing that they weren't that compatible, but as the years went by, it just devolved. At this point in her life, her new husband, Ken, was actually being bullied by her family. I'm not entirely sure why either. I couldn't find too much detail on Ken in general. I think it was just another situation of like, I don't know, I think her parents just were never happy with anything. They had a problem with absolutely everything or they would find a problem with everything. And 
yeah, there was just something about their daughter's new husband that they didn't like and they made him feel very uncomfortable and very unwelcome. And due to this, Ken's mental health, just like his wife's, began to decline rapidly to a point where he wasn't really there for Kathy during her pregnancy. And it was at this point in her life that Kathy Wood turned to food and overeating as a coping mechanism to deal with her emotions. Kathy gained over a hundred pounds throughout her pregnancy. And of course, a, a bit of weight gain is absolutely natural and even recommended when going through pregnancy and childbirth. It's a little bit of cushion for the baby and it's more nutrients for the two of you. You need to be eating more, but a hundred pounds in nine months is quite dangerous, not only for her, but also for her baby. Her blood pressure began to soar insanely high and they were really, really worried about her. And actually, for this reason, she gave birth to her baby quite prematurely. But when she did, everything was fine. Baby was healthy, mum was healthy, and they had a baby girl named Jacqueline. But even after the birth of her daughter, Kathy continued to use food as a coping mechanism to soothe her. She was gaining a lot of weight very quickly and she was isolating herself from the rest of the world as part of this, just to be able to eat in her own home. She didn't wanna do anything else. She didn't wanna go out and socialize. She was so down that she just wanted to be in her enclosure. Her weight just climbed and climbed and climbed until she reached about 450 pounds, which at that point, it's very hard for a person to, to move without getting out of breath or getting into some sort of pain, you know, like joint pain. And it's a really painful existence. At this point, Kathy found it difficult to do pretty much anything other than stay inside the house and just, continue to eat and soothe herself and she was unable to really exercise and at this point it was really affecting more than just her own life she couldn't care for her daughter properly um she wasn't there for her daughter whether it was physical care like changing nappies and stuff or getting up to go and cuddle her when she was crying she she couldn't really do motherhood anymore. Ken ended up having to take on the majority caregiver role because Kathy couldn't do her part. She couldn't play with her daughter. She couldn't get down on her knees to like be with her. And so all of these reasons then meant that Kathy really struggled to bond with her daughter, which made her even more depressed because she felt like a failing mother and she felt like her life was ruined at this point. She was in a, a marriage that she wasn't entirely happy with. She had had a daughter that she wasn't really bonded with and she couldn't really bond with. She was physically unable to move to be able to bond with her daughter. And she was stuck in this really toxic um, addiction to food. This really negative cycle of eating more and then not wanting to leave the house because you've become depressed so you just stay in the house and eat. I don't think she was working at this point in time. Um, everything was just getting worse for Kathy. She was becoming more depressed. Her self-esteem was at an all-time low and all of this turned her quite bitter. She became a very, a very angry, snappy, moody woman at home and this made life even harder for her husband Ken who was working, he was the majority caregiver of their daughter and now his wife was just being mean all the time. But Ken did really want to help her. He wanted to help his wife be happy and healthy again and to be a mother again. And so he suggested anything that he thought could help her, such as going to do like an educational course to get some qualifications, to get a job, or at least just get a low level entry job just to get back out there into the world. And it was with this support from her husband that Kathy managed to find the job as a nurse's aide at Alpine Manor. She specifically requested to do night shifts because night shifts were just generally a bit easier. I mean, most of the residents were asleep, so they were asking for stuff. It was more just getting them ready for bed and putting them to bed and then just kind of sitting around in case any of them woke up in the night and needed anything. And it was there, of course, where she met Gwen Graham. So before we get into the 
catastrophic partnership between these two women, let's go back through Gwen's childhood and upbringing. Gwendolyn Gail Graham was born on August 6th, 1963 in Santa Monica, California, into a very hard family. Her father was a very cruel, emotionless man that insisted that children shouldn't be cuddled or given too much physical affection because it would soften them, it would make them weak. And this is what I mean by she was raised in a very hard family, very emotionless, very cold. Which just that in itself, not being cuddled as a child is known to lead to quite serious psychological effects later in life. Basically, it gives kids problems when their parents aren't affectionate. And that was just the start of a terribly rough upbringing for Gwen. Her first 10 years of her life were spent just constantly moving around. She was never settled anywhere. So for that reason, she never got the chance to really make friends or establish meaningful relationships at all. As soon as she would get to a new place and start a new school and start laying down the groundwork, getting to know people, her parents would pull her out and whisk her away and send her somewhere else. They eventually settled on a farm in Texas when she was about 10 years old. But even through all of that constant turbulence and moving, she couldn't even rely on her family through all of that because like I say, they were very cold and emotionless and it gets even worse than that. Her father, just like Kathy's, was abusive in a multitude of ways, physically, emotionally, and even sexually. All of this absolutely destroyed Gwen's mental health from a very, very young age. She was self-harming by the age of 12. And I believe she did this for multiple reasons. Of course, one of them being a coping mechanism. It is a very common, coping mechanism to deal with such strong, horrific emotions, but also she was doing it to try to make herself look ugly so that her father wouldn't want to sexually abuse her anymore, which is one of the most heartbreaking things to hear a 12 year old was thinking that if she could make herself look ugly and repulsive to her father, then maybe he wouldn't abuse her like that. But that's not how sexual abusers work, really. It's, it's not about attractiveness and desirability. It's more about the power. They just want to exert power over another human being and to them it doesn't really matter how their victim looks. It's the domination and control and being able to terrify and upset their victim, that's what they get off on. Her dad was a sick man, truly. Like, he was horrific in every single way, even outside of the abuse of his family. He was just twisted in the things that he liked and the things that he wanted to do. Like for example, uh, they lived on a farm, like I said, and he would always force Gwen to watch the animals get slaughtered just because I think it again goes back to his wanting to toughen up his kids and not wanting to be too soft. Like he wanted them to witness death and fear and pain and blood because he thought it would be good for them. And that was bad enough in itself having to watch their farm animals get killed, but it got even worse when their family dog that they'd had for over a decade became very sick. Now this dog was like Gwen's best friend. She was very, very close with it. It used to sleep in her room. And so when she knew that it was getting sicker and sicker and probably needed putting down, she was so heartbroken and so torn up about it. She really didn't want them to kill the dog, but her father insisted that they needed to. It was time. So he gave Gwen's older brother a gun and made Gwen watch as her older brother shot her dog to death. And of course, Gwen was so disturbed and so upset witnessing this, but all her family did, especially her father, was just make fun of her for being upset, for being so emotional. And her father, like I said, a very, very sick man, decided to go one step further with this. And that night when Gwen was in bed, he stood outside her bedroom door and scratched at it and like whimpered the dog's name, all to try and tease her, terrify her, upset her, his own daughter. What, what, what would possess a man to want to do that to his own child, to watch her in so much 
pain and distress. Now I don't know at what point Gwen did this but in the aftermath of her dog's death she was struggling really really badly with grief and just trying to process the whole thing and it got to a point I think just a couple of days after they buried the dog that she just couldn't deal with it she just couldn't stand feeling like this anymore and she knew she had to do something and that something she decided to do was go out to the dog's grave and dig it up dig up her dog's dead body Gwen ended up keeping the dog's skull and its teeth in a box for the rest of her life she like carried that around from house to house that she had her first ever dog which you know, I think that's quite normal. People do have like ashes and stuff like that. But the part where she literally went out into the garden and dug up the remains of her dead dog. I don't want to be insensitive around this because people deal with grief in their own ways. And of course she was young, she was a child and she didn't have proper support. But at the same time, you have to think to want to dig up a dead body that you know is not coming back like she knows she's not going to dig up that grave and her dog's going to jump out and you know be her dog again she knows she's going to find a dead body in that grave but I think to want to do that and to act on that you have to question what's going on in a person's psychology. Gwen Graham was very passionate about animals. She always wanted to care for them. She even wanted to be a vet one day. That was like her dream job. Although that didn't end up happening because Gwen had to drop out of high school. I don't know entirely why but she had to drop out of high school meaning that she didn't really get any qualifications. A couple of years later she did end up going somewhere to do some sort of high school equivalent course and from there she went and joined a vocational course for nurses training and you might think this is what led her to working at Alpine Manor but it wasn't she like started training as a nurse and dropped out of that too just want to remind you that she's also currently in Texas and Alpine Manor was all the way in Michigan so yeah the nurses training wasn't quite working out I don't know if she was employed at this point in time but I do know that it was around this time when Gwen was about 20 years old that she met who would become her first proper relationship, an older woman named Fran, who was 28 years old, eight years her senior. I think the two of them were together for quite some time. Um, they even moved in together in Texas, but it wasn't long until Fran decided that life in Texas wasn't really for her. There wasn't much for her there. She wasn't her happiest there and she wanted to move home to where her family lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. She did offer for Gwen to come with her, like they could move together and they could restart their lives in Michigan together. But that was a big decision for Gwen to make, I mean to leave everything behind, absolutely everything, all the friends she'd ever made, all the relationships she'd ever like created. And even her family. This was quite a tough one for Gwen because of course she had horrific relationships with her family but there was always a part of her that wanted to repair that and always hoped that they would somewhat repair at some point in her life and I think moving to Michigan would be kind of admitting to herself that she was giving up on her family relationships. If she was to just move so far away and start a new life, how could she ever expect those familial relationships to repair? Not that I think they ever would. She thought on it for a little while and I think she kind of realized that it, it was fighting a losing game. It was never gonna work. Her father was so incredibly cruel and her mother just seemed very indifferent to how he would treat Gwen. It was kind of hopeless and so she decided to call it quits and move to Grand Rapids with her girlfriend. There were also a few other reasons that made her want to move. Um, she didn't have a, a very good career. I don't know what job she was in at the time but it wasn't exactly a career. It was just a for the time being kind of job and she felt quite lost in life, did Gwen Graham. And she felt that moving to Grand Rapids she would have her older girlfriend and her family, you know, she would find like a bit of a family tree. Her girlfriend could help her to find a job in her hometown and she could live with her girlfriend. Because at this point, actually, Fran had gone 
uh, straight there and she was waiting for Gwen to make her mind up at home. So Gwen was going to join her. So even better, Fran had already kind of established a life in Grand Rapids. She'd gotten an apartment if Gwen ever wanted to join her. Gwen knew that she was deeply, deeply unhappy at home. And Fran knew that too. And so when Gwen kind of came around to wanting to move, Fran was like, okay, I'm gonna look for you some job opportunities here. Like she really wanted to help Gwen find her feet. And that was when they came across a nursing home called Alpine Manor, very close to where Fran lived. It was perfect because obviously Gwen had had an interest in a nursing career once before. She'd tried to join a course, but dropped out. But still, it was something that she was interested in, something that she felt she would be good at. So with that, Gwen Graham picked up and left her life behind in Texas and moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. But she very quickly felt like this was the wrong decision. As soon as she got there, everything felt wrong. The apartment that Fran had gotten was small and dark and a bit gross, like it wasn't a very nice place to live. And Fran herself seemed different. She seemed a bit more distant from Gwen. It, it didn't feel like the same relationship that she'd had back in Texas. But one thing that was going well for Gwen was her new job at Alpine Manor. It was easy <laughs> enough. I mean, she was put on the night shifts as well, which like I say, they, they're not as demanding. Most of it was just serving food to the residents and talking to them and making sure that they had their medication. And it was easy breezy. She kind of enjoyed it. And it would be good for her CV, good for like future jobs to have this kind of nursing experience. Her first day working at Alpine Manor was June 23rd, 1986. And Gwen Graham was an immediate hit with the existing staff. She was fun, she was kind, she was a lesbian, which was always gonna bode well for her there since most of the other women that worked there were lesbians too. Which aside from the obvious like sexual tension or like, you know, people fancying each other, it's just kind of convenient to have your dating pool <laughs> just right there. But other than that aspect of it, having such a strong LGBTQ workforce was just very comforting to all these women to have different people that understood them and had something in common with them and they all related to each other on this level that no one else really could being a, a young lesbian woman. And also just Grand Rapids in general wasn't a very LGBTQ friendly area in the 1980s. So yeah, it was very comforting to have such a community. So a lot of people that you can trust and that understand you and will love and support you for who you are. That's so valuable, especially in the workplace. And like I said in the beginning of the video, they would all go out to the gay bars with each other after work. How convenient that like, all your coworkers wanna go to the same place as you. Ooh. So when both of the women started at Alpine Manor, they were both in separate relationships. Kathy was still married to Ken and they had their daughter and Gwen was still with Fran, even though it, it wasn't going great. It was probably on its way out, but she was still with Fran. But as I'm sure you can imagine, neither of these relationships were gonna last much longer. It was actually, surprisingly, Kathy's marriage that started to break down before Gwen and Fran. Kathy had actually started a little flirtationship at work with one of the other nurses aides named Dawn. And she hadn't left her husband or anything. This was just like a, a sneaky cheeky little something that she shouldn't have been doing. And Kathy knew that she shouldn't be doing this. She shouldn't be having a relationship with Dawn. But she had gotten stuck in a marriage, in a, in a relationship, in a family unit that she didn't want to be in from a very young age. And as of lately, she had been having doubts about her sexuality. She didn't think she liked men, really. But she hadn't had the opportunity to really explore that and realise that because, well, her first relationship with a girl say for the sake of argument that she knew that she was dating Debbie and that it was a lie when she told her parents about David. After the reaction that she got from that first lesbian relationship, she was told that it was horrific and it was bad and she should be thrown in a, in a psychiatric hospital. Horrible, horrible things. So her next relationship, no doubt, she didn't want to repeat that. 
And so she gets with a man, Ken. And then all of a sudden she's pregnant, she's married, she's locked in and she realizes, fuck, I never actually wanted any of this. I wanted a woman. So I think that's why this little flirtationship with Dawn started at work. And I'm not condoning it at all. I'm not condoning cheating, but I think it makes a lot of sense if you look back at her dating history that maybe she did just wanna be with women all along but I think, yeah, she did get stuck and she was then realizing I would actually be a lot happier if I was with a woman, if I was living authentically to myself. And Kathy and Dawn had a nice time together. This was a fun little flirtationship, but that was nothing compared to when Kathy would first meet Gwen Graham on one of their night shifts. It was like an instant click, instant chemistry between these two women. They got on like a house on fire, which is quite an accurate metaphor actually, considering the total destruction and terror that came as a byproduct of their relationship. The two women immediately became inseparable. They would spend their whole entire shift talking and flirting. They would spend their break times together. They would eat together in the canteen. They would even start hanging out after work together and on the weekends together. Seriously, these two women were never apart. Then after just three weeks of knowing each other, Gwen and Kathy decided to move in together. They were gonna get an apartment and move in just as friends though, or at least that's what they told everyone. I mean, a lot of this case is just like what these women have told people, but you soon find out that they're both compulsive liars. So it's like, what is the truth in this case? Anyway, they move in together after three weeks of being friends and they tell everyone that like, they're just roommates, you know, they're just two coworkers living together. I don't think it was ever that. I, I think the two of them immediately started a little bit of something that they shouldn't and they both kind of left their partners in a, a very messy way. They moved out from their partners before they actually broke things off. I think Gwen had a bit more of an excuse to be able to do it with Fran because Fran's apartment was very small and like I said, a bit gross. So I think she was like, look, uh, I'm gonna move in with one of my friends. I don't know how you bring that up to your husband that like, oh honey, um, I'm gonna move out of our family home with our that we have with our daughter. And I'm gonna move in with this lass that I met at work three weeks ago. I don't really know how that must have gone down in their marriage, but um, it did. Although it wasn't long after they, they moved into this apartment together that they did decide to break things off with their previous partners. And remember, there's three partners for them to break up with as well, not just the two. So Gwen broke up with Fran and I think they kind of saw that one come in. Like I say, Fran even hadn't been the same since Gwen moved to Michigan to meet her. So I think that was quite an easy breakup. But Kathy had to divorce her husband and they had to go through all the court proceedings and everything. He got custody of their daughter. Like that was messy. And Kathy also had to break up with this woman that she'd been seeing at work to then start seeing another woman from work. So I imagine that was quite awkward, her breaking up with Dawn, you know, the woman that she'd been like in a little flirtationship with. I keep saying flirtationship, but I don't, I really don't know how deep that went. They could have been full on affair sleeping together or it could have just been like a, a work wife. I don't know. But the point is now there are three broken hearts, two households ripped apart, but now Gwen and Kathy are in a full fledged relationship together. They're living together, they're working together, they're going out and partying in the evenings together. They are totally inseparable and also totally and utterly toxic for each other. They enabled and encouraged uh, really bad self-destructive behaviors in each other, like drinking so much every night that they would black out, regular occurrence. Or if they didn't drink enough that they were like, passing out and like forgetting gaps of the night. They were getting drunk and fighting each other. They would get into absolutely catastrophic arguments which would then turn physical. They would physically fight each other. And when it wasn't a physical fight, it was screaming at each other, manipulating each other, threatening each other. Absolute mental torture. The two of them would self-harm in front of each other and it was just so 
tumultuous in so many different ways. It was such an intensely volatile relationship and they made no effort to hide this from anyone around them. Like they were toxic behind closed doors and they were toxic in front of coworkers, in front of friends, in front of anyone. They didn't care who saw. To be honest, they weren't as bad when they were in work. It was more so like when they'd be out drinking, but then they would just like turn up the next day at work completely right as rain and they'd be flirting with each other again and they'd like as if nothing had just happened the night before. This was that regular of an occurrence that they would get over such destructive fights that would break up most relationships just like that because they knew that they could because this happens all the time and then we're fine again, like it's fine. But what was so intoxicating to Gwen and Kathy, the thing that kept them together through such a tumultuous relationship and such is the case with a lot of abusive relationships was all of these really intense high highs that would almost make them forget about those really low lows. The highs of their relationship being this like cheeky little workplace romance, the adrenaline that comes with that, the butterflies, the newness of this relationship, especially for Kathy who hadn't been with a woman in years and years and years since her first ever relationship because she was locked in a marriage that she didn't want. So this was all so new and so exciting. And they were so codependent on each other, spending so much time with each other, their emotions completely depended on each other. So when they were in good moods and when they were like out drinking and having a great time, they were having an amazing time. But then they would come home from those amazing nights and have physical fights and manipulate each other and end up self-harming and it was such an intense roller coaster throughout this whole relationship on a daily basis. And another thing that these women really, really bonded over, which again, I think is a big factor as to why they stayed together through all of this, was that they both had such intense trauma in their past that they could both relate to each other and they could both talk it out together and other people didn't quite understand them on that level. They'd never found anyone who had been through something quite as horrific as they had. And this was the first time, other than their own siblings, that they could find someone that could relate and that could comfort them. This connection between them made their relationship feel unlike anything they had ever felt before because they couldn't get on to such a deep level with anyone before this. So that was the kind of relationship that they had. It was comforting in a way, but it was tearing them apart more than anything. So the dynamic of this relationship, Kathy was the more sensible, calm, down to earth, grounded one. She liked to make the decisions. She liked to be in control. I think some of this comes from the fact that she'd had a very settled life anyway before she met Gwen. I mean, she'd been a wife, she'd been married, she'd been a mother. She, yeah, she'd had like a really, settled down family life. Gwen, on the other hand, as we mentioned, was very lost. Before Alpine Manor, she didn't have a career. She had just left her hometown and the family that she never really got on with. She moved to Grand Rapids and suddenly her girlfriend's being off. Uh, the apartment is a bit grim. Like, she's just very lost in life. She doesn't know where she's going. She doesn't know what she wants to do. She doesn't know how to get there. And she needs a grounding force like Kathy. And Kathy wanted to be that for Gwen. As long as Gwen doted on her and adored her, she was happy if she got to make all the decisions, you know? Gwen really needed that constant attention and reassurance and direction from her partner. And Kathy could provide that for her. Their relationship was obviously very, very unhealthy. And everyone around them knew that as well, because like I said, they made no effort to hide it. Throughout their relationship together, the two of them seemed to just get worse and worse, mental health wise, but also just as human beings, they were outwardly changing for the worst. Like their personalities and just everything about them was just becoming very unpleasant. For example, they started pulling pranks on other staff at Alpine Manor and even different residents. Literally the elderly, disabled, vulnerable people that they are paid to look after, 
they started pulling pranks on them. For example, they would take the residents, like sneak them into another room and not tell any of the other staff. So they were essentially like hiding the patients and having other staff running around panicked looking for them. Meanwhile, these patients, obviously we don't really know what was going through their heads and what they were thinking, but I'm guessing a lot of them didn't even realize what was going on, didn't even realize that they were part of a prank. I don't know, when you're a patient somewhere and you trust everyone around you to take care of you, I think you would probably just assume that they were doing it for some good reason. They were taking you from one room to another for a reason, not for a prank, not just to worry their co-workers about the safety of their patients. But one of the most heartless things about these pranks is that these residents that were then, you know, taken to another room and no one was told about it, they were missing out on care for like whole chunks of time, like an hour or two, until the rest of the staff found them. They weren't getting medication, they weren't getting water, food, anything, social time, absolutely nothing. They were just locked in another room, which I think is so sick that you would want to do that to vulnerable people. There's nothing pranky about it when a vulnerable person is being abused like this. It's literally just sadistic. It's not like you're hiding your coworkers stapler, putting your coworkers stapler in some jelly. Like, I don't know, there's nothing pranky about this to me. It just makes me feel so upset to know that these people were just being locked in another room, taken away from, from where they felt comfortable and safe and just locked somewhere else until they were found. All of Kathy and Gwen's like friends and family look back on this time that they were working at Alpine Manor in 1987. And in retrospect, they realized that the two women were saying a lot of weird and suspicious shit around that time, but they just hadn't quite clocked on. Things like no one would believe what we're doing at work and stuff like that. I don't know, they would keep it like secretive and make it sound like they were up to something. And at the time people just thought like, oh, they're doing something behind their boss's back or like, I don't know, something about their relationship. I don't know. But no one actually assumed that it was something dark, something sinister. They wouldn't often be questioned about these things that they were saying about work. Like no one would believe what we're doing. No one really questioned them about it because they just came up with their own things in their head. But there was one time that Kathy was questioned on why, what are you getting up to at work? And she told this person nothing that we would get in trouble for. Hmm. But that wasn't exactly true, was it? And very soon, they would be getting in trouble for what they were doing behind closed doors at Alpine Manor. The truth was exposed a year later in 1988, and the one to do it was actually Kathy's ex-husband, Ken Wood. They'd been split up for over a year now, but they were actually still in touch a little bit. By this point in 1988, Kathy and Gwen's whirlwind romance had actually burnt out. And it burnt out in a very dramatic way. Maybe burnt out isn't even the word to use because the way that this ended, Kathy caught Gwen cheating on her with another nurse's aide from Alpine Manor. She was being unfaithful behind her back, but right in front of her face. Like imagine trying to cheat on your partner that you work with, with someone else from work. Like, of course, it was always gonna blow up and it was gonna be this huge dramatic thing. And this came as quite a shock to, well, Kathy at least, but I think quite a lot of people at work because Kathy and Gwen had been a very public couple. Like, they would be PDAing all over that nursing home. So everyone that worked there, all the residents, absolutely everyone knew that Kathy and Gwen were a couple. They made no efforts to hide it. In fact, they would rub it in everyone's faces. So the fact that Gwen had managed to cheat with someone from, that also worked there, that probably knew she was in a relationship is crazy. When Kathy found out about the infidelity, she was absolutely broken. In fact, it sent her spiraling. Her whole world was shattered completely because she had grown such an intense bond with this woman over the last year. She'd cut off her whole life, her whole past up until that point for this woman and now all of that was gone. They lived together, they worked together, they partied together, they had the same friend group. Literally every single aspect of their lives was linked. And I can't imagine how 
painful that must be to sever all of those links so suddenly as well to find out in such a horrific way. Following the breakup, Kathy didn't really have anyone else in her life and I believe this is why her and Ken kind of stayed in contact a little bit because he was her whole entire life. She'd cut off all her family and moved away with him and their daughter and yeah, and then she left them for this woman. So these are kind of the only people that she's got in her life. Kathy found herself with no one else to confide in pretty much in the whole entire world other than her ex-husband, Ken, which is a very strange set of circumstances to find yourself in. Like imagine cheating on your husband with a woman and then leaving him with, with your daughter, just abandoning your whole family for this woman. And then when she cheats on you, you find yourself crawling back to your ex-husband just for someone to talk to. I mean, it serves her right, it really does. And it wasn't even like she was crawling back to him because she wanted to get back with him and like she'd realized she'd made a mistake. It was literally just because she had no one else to talk to. She had no one, she had no friends, nothing. She needed a shoulder to cry on. So she was going back to her ex-husband to cry about the woman that she cheated with. Mm. He's a better man than I, <laughs> truly. If my ex came back to me in this set of circumstances, I would not be willing to hear them out, let's just say that. But anyway, Ken sits Kathy down and he gives her a shoulder to cry on and she tells him everything. And when I say everything, I mean absolutely everything that she'd never told anyone else before and Gwen had never told anyone else before, including the true horrors of their relationship and what was going on behind those doors of Alpine Manor. So now, I'm gonna tell you everything that had been happening for the past year that somehow no one else knew about. Kathy said that when she first met Gwen at work, the two of them instantly fell head over heels in love. It was like this obsessive, lovesick, love at first sight kind of connection, which, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but imagine being her ex-husband, hearing this. I would never be the same again if my ex came crawling back to me and she was like, yeah, you know the one that I cheated on you with? Oh, it was just love at first sight. Oh my God. Anyway, continuing on. Wait, actually, before I continue on though, cause I'm not gonna keep interrupting myself. I just want you to remember all throughout this story that she was telling her ex-husband this. They go into detail about her sex life with Gwen and uh, everything. I just, I just want you to just keep in mind who the original audience of all of this information was. So anyway, back to the story. Uh, Kathy says that she and Gwen immediately start a sexual relationship, a BDSM sexual relationship. Kathy said that she was the submissive partner. She always pretended to be like, naive and weak whenever she was around Gwen who liked to dominate her partners. Kathy told her ex-husband that their BDSM relationship started off very normal and enjoyable. That was until Kathy just started getting more and more aggressive, more and more violent, and she started genuinely scaring Kathy, genuinely hurting her as well. Like this was going beyond the boundaries of a consensual BDSM relationship. Kathy even told Ken about this one time where Gwen had tied her to the bed and grabbed a gun and inserted it inside her and was acting as though she was gonna shoot it. Kathy said that she was very fearful of her own girlfriend a lot of the time, but she would consent to all these crazy things that Gwen wanted to try with her just to keep Gwen happy because she was actually worried about when she got aggressive and when she got violent and when she got scary. Kathy thought it was just better to go along with anything that Gwen wanted. I just wanna put a side note in here that that is not consent, even though Kathy thought that she was consenting to things. Consenting under duress is not consent, that is, that is duress, that is being forced into things that you don't wanna do. But Kathy would make it look like consent to Gwen so that Gwen wouldn't get angry. Kathy said that she and Gwen really, really bonded quite early on in their relationship over their trauma. They both had very similar childhood and familial trauma that they could both talk about and, and relate to. They were both very, very mentally ill and had been since they were both children. Um, uh, mainly because of being abused as children. And so now as adults, when they met each other, the two of them would talk and fantasize about what it would be like to get revenge 
on their abusers. And it was then that the topic of killing people was first brought up by Gwen. She was just saying, I, w I wonder what it would feel like to kill someone. Over time, this topic came up more and more and Gwen would get more and more into it, more and more excited until it was clear that it was no longer a fantasy and it was becoming a plan, an actual plan to commit murder. But the more that they talked about it, the more it strayed from the original plan or the original idea, which would be to get revenge on their abusers and to kill their abusers. Now it was just a conversation about murder in general. What would it feel like to commit murder? What would it feel like to hurt someone, to take a life? Kathy claims that she didn't fully believe Gwen. She thought that this was all just some sort of twisted fantasy, some like weird depraved interest that she had that she felt comfortable telling Kathy about. So Kathy didn't think it was anything too serious until Gwen did the unthinkable on January 18th, 1987. One of their residents at Alpine Manor was a 60 year old woman named Marguerite Chambers. She'd had Alzheimer's for 12 years at this point and for the last five years, she'd needed constant live-in care to be able to meet her basic needs. So for that reason, she'd been at Alpine Manor for five years. She had a great relationship with all the staff, all the other residents, she was, quite popular there. I mean, she'd been there for half a decade and she was very comfortable and very happy. And her family were very happy with the care that she'd been receiving for the last five years. Before the Alzheimer's had taken over her, Marguerite was a very bubbly, outgoing, fun loving kind of gal. She was like the life of the party. And so for that reason, she really loved the social side of living at Alpine Manor. She just suddenly had like loads of mates, loads of roommates. Marguerite had been very adventurous throughout her life. She was a dancer, she loved water skiing, she had a beautiful big family with her husband that she was still with actually. He used to come and visit her at Alpine Manor. They'd been together for decades. And on that day, January 18th, her husband came down to Alpine Manor to see her as he did pretty much every single day but this time he didn't know it was gonna be the last. They sat and talked for about an hour, caught up, and then he gave her a kiss and said goodbye and went to return home for the evening. There was no reason for either of them to think that this could ever be their last encounter together because even though Marguerite was in assisted living and she needed all this help from Alpine Manor, she was in a relatively good way. Her health hadn't like sharply declined or anything like that. There were no warning signs that she could just drop dead overnight. So as Kathy is telling this story to her ex-husband, Ken, she said that after Marguerite's husband had left for the night, Gwen suddenly started acting weird. Despite that, they continued to do their job as normal. They gave all the residents their medication, they gave them dinner, helped them to wash and get ready for bed, put them all to bed as usual. Everything went normally. And it was then when Alpine Manor was quiet and peaceful that Gwen grabbed Kathy's arm and led her to the doorway of Marguerite Chambers' bedroom. Gwen told her to stand guard outside the bedroom door. She needed to watch and if anyone started approaching, she needed to alert Gwen. So Kathy just kind of stood there and did as she was told as Gwen walked inside the bedroom and approached her sleeping victim in bed. She lifted a damp cloth that she'd been holding this entire time and she smothered Marguerite's nose and mouth with this cloth. Of course, Marguerite tried to fight back a little bit. This will have been very confusing for her. I mean, she was in a sleep and then suddenly she's got something covering all of her breathing holes. She starts to kind of fight back, but like I say, she was a 60 year old woman that needed constant care. She didn't fight back all that much. And Gwen just kept that face cloth in place until Marguerite fell limp. And just like that, Gwen Graham had murdered someone just as she'd been talking about for so long. And now it was real. It was, it was that quick, it was that, easy. Gwen had specifically chosen Marguerite as a victim because she knew that she was physically weak 
and that she wouldn't try to fight back and it wouldn't be hard to overpower her. Kathy said that when Gwen was finished, she took a step back and just looked at Marguerite's dead body on the bed, almost as if she was admiring her work, as if she wanted to absorb everything that had just happened. She wanted to remember this mental image. She then walked over to Kathy, grabbed her arm once again, as she had leading her to the bedroom, and she led her back to whatever they were working on before they committed murder. And they just carried on their shift as if nothing had just happened. They were gonna wait for someone else to find the dead body. And less than an hour later, when another one of the nurse's aides went in to go and check on Marguerite, they discovered her dead. It was just gonna be a regular check. This other nurse's aide that hasn't been named uh, just went in and immediately, as soon as she walked in the room, she knew that something was wrong. Marguerite looked pale. She, she didn't look like Marguerite. And so the nurse went over and as she touched her hand, she realized that Marguerite was completely cold. And at that point she realized she was unresponsive. And as soon as they checked her vital signs, they realized she was dead. Everyone at Alpine Manor was shocked and devastated to hear the news of Marguerite's passing. Like I said, she'd been there for so long. She was everyone's close friend and it was so unexpected. I mean, even though she had had Alzheimer's for 12 years and it had been pretty bad for five of them, she was in a, a relatively stable condition. Like I'd said before, there were no warning signs that her time was nearing an end. But even though there were no immediate warning signs, they'd all kind of known that this day was coming. They'd all known to expect the day that Marguerite was gonna pass away because, I mean, that's why she was at Alpine Manor because her health was just deteriorating. And at this point she needed end of life care. And while they hadn't expected her to die so quickly, they had known that one day they were gonna walk into Marguerite Chambers' bedroom and find her dead. They just hadn't expected it to be now. So when she was found dead, there was not much questioning what happened. I mean, she was a very poorly lady and she had been for a long time. It seemed obvious that her cause of death will have just been something to do with her Alzheimer's. Her body was transported to a morgue and her death certificate was signed the next day. They didn't see there to be much point in doing an autopsy because, like I say, the cause of death seemed obvious and so it was just recorded as natural causes. Kathy and Gwen had acted just as shocked and devastated and tearful as all of the other staff at Alpine Manor that night. And actually in the aftermath of the murder, the two of them took two days off of work. I believe they said it was to, to grieve and to, to pull themselves back together. But for the next two days, Kathy and Gwen spent the whole thing just drinking, doing drugs, having sex, holed up in their apartment. Like they barely left their apartment unless it was to go to the bar and drink more or to go out and buy drugs or whatever. But the whole time they were just like locked in their apartment, having some kind of hedonistic bender. And obviously part of this bender was having their very dangerous, non-consensual BDSM sex that Kathy was still very much uncomfortable with. But her scariest encounter was still yet to come. Well, actually it came in the middle of this bender when Gwen seemed to want to relive the exhilaration that she had felt the night that she murdered Marguerite Chambers. As the two of them were having sex, Gwen grabbed a damp cloth and smothered Kathy's nose and mouth with it until she passed out. Marguerite Chambers was the first victim of the lethal lovers, but she was nowhere near the last. Kathy went on to tell her ex-husband, Ken, that they had gone through with this four more times after that. And it was almost an exact repeat of the first process. It was like a copy and paste guide to murder. And she said that the two of them even decided to make it a little game right here in the beginning. After they killed their first victim, they knew that they were gonna kill more. And so they decided to make a game of it to try and spell out the word murder using their victim's first initials. So their first victim was Marguerite, M. Their next would have to be a U. M, U, and they never actually got there. So this game ended after, after one letter, 
because U is quite a unique uh, first initial, I think. And remember, they're picking from people in Alpine Manor, so it's quite a small sample pool. Basically, they decided to break this pattern after the first victim and instead just go for any victim that they thought would be an easy kill. But before we continue talking about victims of the lethal lovers, I wanna just focus on how stupid that was, how stupid these women were. They hadn't even made up this game in time for their first victim. They killed their first victim and then they were like, oh, okay, let's make this a game. And then never even, never even followed through on that. So they never actually intentionally killed anyone with this game in mind. They made it up and then canceled it before they even got to their second victim. So anyway, the next Alpine Manor resident to be found dead was a woman named Myrtle Luce, who was just days away from her 96th birthday. And like I said, each murder was pretty much a copy and paste of the last, so everything happened exactly the same, apart from when Gwen was finished smothering Myrtle, she actually left that damp washcloth on the side in her bedroom so that the murder weapon could just be in plain sight when the body was found. And who was ever gonna know it was a murder weapon? It was just a washcloth. Between each murder that they would commit, Kathy and Gwen would have these benders of sex and drugs and drink in their apartment and they would discuss the killings in great detail. And they really felt like the murders that they were committing together were bonding them somehow. They were bringing them closer together. They were now sharing a connection that neither of them had with anyone else because they'd never committed murder, a crime as horrific as double murder now with anyone else. So they had this kind of connection that that they'd never felt before. The two of them wanted to be bound for life in this relationship. They wanted a connection between them, a link between them, for the rest of forever that no one else could ever replicate. And they felt like sharing this life ruining secret of being murderers together gave them a type of insurance in their relationship that would bind them better than any kind of relationship title, any kind of marriage, any children ever could. They were both keeping this secret to save each other's lives, essentially. If either of them was to give over this secret to anyone, both of their lives would be over. They would both be in prison for the rest of their lives. So yeah, sharing this secret together did in a way bring them closer than they'd ever been before, but in the most horrific of ways. Because even if they were to ever split up and you know break up and move on with their lives, they would still be connected by the worst thing they had ever done in their whole lives. Both of their freedom depended on both of them keeping this secret. And that would always be something that the two of them would share, just them two. And to them, that was incredibly romantic in some kind of twisted way, that they would always have this invisible link of murder for the rest of their lives. And I also think there was an element of control in this major secret keeping. I think definitely on Gwen's part because she seemed to be the instigator of a lot of the dark elements of their relationship. Think the non-consensual BDSM and when she was talking about, I wonder what it would feel like to kill someone. And then that eventually led into this. I mean, I think Gwen liked to have a lot of control. She wanted to feel like Kathy would do anything for her, including keeping the worst secret that either of them have ever had to keep. The Lethal Lover's third kill in three weeks was a 79 year old woman named Mae Mason. Between the regular scheduled nighttime checks, Kathy stood guard at the door while Gwen snuck into Mae's bedroom and smothered her with a washcloth. Again, her death was attributed to natural causes. They actually believed this one to be a heart attack. And you know, no one ever questioned these natural causes deaths because it, it was a residential home full of elderly and vulnerable people that were nearing the end of their lives or they were very, very ill with different ailments and everyone kind of knew that their deaths 
were coming. So when they did eventually come, no one really questioned it. No one demanded autopsies. No one thought anything to be suspicious. The very next day after Mae Mason died, her death certificate was signed. It was natural causes and her body was cremated straight away. So all the evidence relating to that murder was gone. Kathy said that the lethal lovers actually had a little bit of a tradition that they started doing after every murder and they would they would add to it after every murder as well. She said that to each other, they would say, I love you forever and a day. And after every murder that they committed, they would add on another day. So I love you forever and two days, forever and three days, until they got up to forever and five days. Their fourth murder was of a 74 year old woman named Belle Burkhard. And Belle, in the weeks running up to her murder, she had had a couple of medical issues. Now I don't know the specifics, but it was for that exact reason that Kathy and Gwen thought she would be the perfect victim because no one would really question her passing. She'd had dementia for years and she'd been having regular seizures for years as well, but it was over the last few months that her health seemed to be deteriorating. She was having all these other issues and that was actually why she was moved to Alpine Manor because her family knew that they couldn't look after her, but they trusted Alpine Manor and all of their nurses to be able to do that. Belle was found dead by one of the nurse's aides in the early hours of the morning on February 26th, 1987. Again, no suspicions were raised at all. Her death was filed as natural causes. And their fifth and final murder took place on April 7th when the lethal lovers murdered the oldest resident of Alpine Manor and honestly, one of the most popular. Edith Cook was 97 years old at the time and she had been at Alpine Manor for quite a while. She had been a poorly woman for a good amount of years. But that being said, she was one of the most brightest, smiliest, happiest, most energetic residents at the whole of Alpine Manor. Despite her age, I mean, 97 and despite her illnesses and despite how her health had been gradually declining over the years, none of that ever changed her personality. And everyone at Alpine Manor, staff and residents alike, adored Edith. At the time of her death, Edith was relatively, you know, like alert and well, but that being said, she was 97 and her health had been declining over the years. So Gwen and Kathy knew that her death wouldn't really be questioned. They carried out the murder pretty much the exact same as they'd carried out the other four. But at the very end, when the two of them would usually just like run off back to work and carry on with whatever they were doing beforehand and just kind of lay low until someone else found the body, they decided to not do it like that this time. In fact, it was Kathy Wood herself that ran to her superiors and said that she had just found Edith dead in her bedroom. Other nurses rushed into the bedroom and declared her dead when they couldn't find her pulse. And at this point, her body was still warm. Kathy Wood had literally ran right from the murder taking place to go and report it. And this was the first time the lethal lovers had ever self-reported their crimes. But as with all the others, no one really suspected anything and Edith's death was ruled as natural causes, just like the last four murder victims' deaths had. After committing their fifth murder, Kathy and Gwen went and had sex, I believe in Alpine Manor. And apparently this was something that they did after every murder, which is so disturbing that that's like one of the first things on your mind when you've just committed murder. And ah, it just, it really tells you a lot about like their thought, thought process behind all of this and the satisfaction that they're getting out of this and the excitement and I don't know. That's one of the most disturbing parts of all of it to me. How can you murder an old woman in her bed and then be in that kind of mood. Ugh. So they commit this fifth murder, they go and have sex, and then Kathy wrote Gwen a poem that ended with the line, when you're mine, oh please say you'll be mine forever and five days. And after that fifth murder, the killings suddenly stopped. Gwen and Kathy remained together, but I believe it was around this time that Gwen had gotten involved with another nurse's aide at Alpine Manor the one that she ended up getting caught with. Gwen's new girlfriend was called Robin and Robin was well aware that she was 
dating a taken woman because Gwen and Kathy were a very public couple at Alpine Manor. Everyone knew that they were together. And so Robin knew that she had to keep her relationship with Gwen quiet and they had to keep whatever they had as much of a secret as they could to avoid the word getting out to Kathy. And they they did this for quite a while successfully, but obviously not long enough because Kathy eventually caught them. Of course, she was furious discovering that Gwen had cheated on her, that she had been unfaithful. And I think most people in that situation would leave that partner and move on. But remember, Kathy and Gwen decided to bond themselves with murder. They have this connection to each other that they feel like they will never get with anyone else. They have this secret between them that they need to keep. That was kind of the point of the murders. That was that was the whole thing that kept them doing it, that, that got them so excited about it whenever they would be like at home afterwards talking about it and ha having sex. They liked that they were bonded and connected so deeply through these murders. So that's why when Kathy finds out that Gwen's cheating on her, she doesn't split up with her because, well, they're together forever now. So she stays with Gwen and Gwen stays with Robin too. So now this is kind of like a love triangle, but obviously Kathy don't want shit to do with Robin. She hates Robin. But Gwen just has two girlfriends now, one of which she murders people with, the other one knows nothing about it. And that marks the end of this whole insane, unbelievable story that Kathy Wood was telling to her ex-husband, Ken. And he doesn't believe her, actually, because Kathy Wood had always been a compulsive liar and a narcissist. She had lied to him and made so much shit up throughout their whole marriage, especially when she was angry or when she was trying to hurt other people. And this was all very convenient to come out right after she found out that her girlfriend was cheating on her. Honestly, Ken just thought that this was Kathy trying to set up some insane revenge plan against Gwen. She cheated on her, so now Kathy's gonna get her thrown in prison for being a serial killer. But all that being said, Ken couldn't look past how detailed Kathy's story was and how much of it incriminated her as well. And, you know, if she was trying to get Gwen back for cheating on her and get her thrown in prison for being a serial killer, she wouldn't have included herself in that story, surely, because I don't know, if the plan goes how she wants it to, then she would also get thrown in prison. So that was the thing that was kind of putting Ken off of thinking it was a complete lie. When Kathy left his house that evening, Ken didn't tell anyone what she had told him. For many reasons, one, because he didn't think it was 100% the truth and he didn't know what was true and what was a lie or how serious this whole thing even was. And another reason why he hadn't told anyone was because he was so shocked and disgusted and horrified by what Kathy had just told him that he was honestly, like in a bit of shock. He couldn't quite comprehend that his ex-wife had just come to him and said that she had helped to murder five innocent elderly residents of a care home. He just could not, it just, it just wouldn't sink in his head. He didn't want to repeat those words to anyone else. So for all those reasons, he just kind of kept this to himself, hoping that it would resolve some other way. The two of them ended up meeting up again quite a few times after this, Kathy and Ken, um, and of course it was brought up again. And after a while, Ken was actually starting to believe her. When he was able to ask more and more questions and she had the answers, he was really starting to believe her. One of his main questions was why? Why do you need to murder these people? And he even tried to suggest that it could have been empathetic. He was, he was trying to come up with reasons in his head why his ex-wife, the woman that he had once loved and had a baby with, why she could possibly do this. So he was trying to suggest that maybe it was empathetic and maybe, you know, these old people were like really ill and needed putting out of their misery. And so his wife, his ex-wife, was doing that. But Kathy very quickly shattered this theory when she turned to him and said, no, we did it because it was fun. When it finally sunk in for Ken, just how depraved and soulless Kathy was, 
he actually suggested that she should go and get some psychological help because she was sick and twisted in the head, to be honest. He said that she should be hospitalized and the police should hear about this. He was in a proper panic. Now that he realized how big all of this was, it was gonna be a whole massive police investigation. His ex-wife was a serial killer. He knew he needed to do something about this. He was really, really flustered, but Kathy stopped him and told him that if he dared go to the police and tell them anything, she would kill herself. And so for that reason, he didn't. He didn't go to the police because he didn't, didn't want her to die. So now there were three people that were in on this secret, Kathy, Gwen, and Ken. He just had to keep this secret and he did for months, months and months and months, knowing that his ex-wife, who is still with her murderous girlfriend, is a serial killer. He knows all of this, that five elderly people died at the hands of these women. Which, by the way, is this, is this not breaking their like pact that the two of them had between them, that, that they were gonna share this secret that no one else was gonna know about? kathy has gone and told her ex-husband. That's letting someone in on your little bond thingy, isn't it? And this was one of their main reasons for having this pact, this secret, is because as soon as that pact was broken and someone else was told, it would only be a matter of time until that came back to bite them, until the secret was fully out and they were in trouble. Kathy thought that she could trust Ken with this secret. She even put her own life in the mix just to manipulate him into keeping this secret, but it would only be a matter of time until everything caught up with them. In July, 1987, Kathy and Gwen got into one last huge, fight and Gwen actually ended up packing all her bags, packing up all her shit as if she was gonna leave, as if she was gonna walk out on Kathy once and for all. In retaliation, because obviously Kathy didn't want Gwen to leave her, she decided to threaten Gwen's girlfriend, Robin, but this didn't really work. I mean, let's be honest, Gwen never really got that attached to people because there was always a new one. So as much as she was like pissed off at Kathy for threatening Robin, she was like, none of this even matters to me. And Gwen left anyway. She left Alpine Manor, she left Kathy behind, she left Robin behind, she left everything behind and she moved to Texas. So now Gwen is gone. She's in a complete other state and Kathy is just there in Grand Rapids, still working at Alpine Manor, she is still divorced and her ex-husband has custody of her daughter. And she's just kind of looking at her life now, post Gwen, thinking what the fuck happened? She's lost everything. She has lost everything. She has lost her girlfriend. She has lost her ex-husband that she left her girlfriend for. And now she's just working this job at a residential care home and her girlfriend's not there anymore. It's a bit boring. Nothing's the same without Gwen. But the world keeps turning and life went on and Kathy just kept living her very normal life now, keeping this insane secret that she was a serial killer. Everyone was keeping this secret pretty well actually, including Ken. He kept his mouth shut for over a year. He didn't tell anyone. Everything just continued as if nothing had ever even happened. That was until one bombshell of a day in the fall of 1988 when police actually turned up at Alpine Manor. Because the police had never come digging before and because no one had ever mentioned anything to her, mentioned any suspicions, Kathy had naively convinced herself in her head that everything was gonna be fine and that she'd completely gotten away with these murders. But what she didn't know was that the knowledge of the murders was eating Ken alive. He had had nothing to do with any of this, but because she had let him in on this deep, dark secret that she shared with Gwen, he felt responsible now. And for the last year, it had just been eating away at him. He felt so guilty that he was sitting on this knowledge and not telling the police. And so finally, at this point, he cracked and he had gone and told them everything that Kathy had told him. So police arrived at Alpine Manor and arrested Kathy Wood on shift 
on suspicion of multiple murders. And all of the other staff and all of the residents looked on in horror as one of their favorite nurses aides got handcuffed and thrown in the back of a police car. When Ken had told the police all of Kathy's story, he had made sure to tell them that Kathy is a compulsive liar and a narcissist, and she does embellish things a lot. So he had urged them to really try and find some physical evidence of Kathy's claims, just to back everything up. And even the police actually were a bit skeptical at first, kind of the way that Ken was skeptical of Kathy in the beginning, because they learned that Kathy was his ex-wife. And so they were like, oh, maybe this Ken guy is just trying to get revenge on his ex-wife that's like moved on. But no, as soon as they started looking into this case, they were like, oh shit, this is serious. They dug up the Alpine Manor patient records, specifically the patient death records, and they spotted those five deaths in very quick succession in the first few months of 1987. The five deaths that Ken thought that Kathy was responsible for. So police cross-checked these death records, the time and date of death, with the employee records of Alpine Manor to see which nurses' aides were in on the nights that these people were killed. And Kathy Wood and Gwen Graham, you guessed it, were on shift for every single one of those five murders. Not murders, sorry, deaths. The, this was the death record. They don't know that they're murders yet. And in fact, the police are a little bit like, still a little bit skeptical because they can see that all of these patients' death records were all natural causes. And that, you know, doctors had seen them and released their bodies to their families for burial or cremation. So police were a bit like, yeah, it's suspicious that the women were in work on all these times, but nothing proves that they murdered them, like intentionally took their lives. So police had already done all of that work like behind the scenes when Ken came to them and told them this story. They did all that work before even getting in touch with Kathy. So they've got all these records up and they know that she was in work when all of these people died. So it was at this point they decided they wanted to go and speak to her. So they go down to Alpine Manor, they arrest her and they take her back to the police station. Once she was sat down with the officers, she relayed kind of the exact same story to them that she told Ken, that Gwen was the murderer, she was the sadistic malicious one and Kathy had just been dragged along the whole time and told to keep weight and told to cover things up. She made out like she had been pressured to be a part of these sadistic killings by her girlfriend and none of it was her fault. Police didn't confront her on this at all, at least not at first. They wanted her to tell her version of events and they kind of fed into it a little bit and they asked her questions about her evil girlfriend and everything. They tried asking her for a bunch of information that would connect her and Gwen specifically to these five deaths, like what were the names of her five victims? And she gave them all over and they were all the same names as those five deaths in quick succession at the start of the year. Kathy told the police that it was Gwen that did absolutely every single one of the murders. She said that she herself hadn't actually touched any of the murder victims. It was Gwen that would always approach them with a damp washcloth. She would smother them. She did it the exact same five times over. And all Kathy did was just stand in the doorway and keep watch. She never actually did anything or at least that's kind of what she wanted to make out to the police. She was making out the whole time that she was very naive, very weak, very easily controlled, and that her girlfriend was evil and, and manipulative and, and threatening. She said that Gwen was the mastermind behind all of this. She was depraved, she was sick, she was evil. She would really get off on what they were doing. So the Michigan police contacted Texan police, cause Gwen had moved there now, and they told them, oi, go and arrest Gwen Graham right now. We think she's a serial killer. And they were like, oh, okay. So the very same day, Gwen was brought into a Texas police station for questioning and things only got really really confusing from here. Gwen told the police the exact same story that Kathy had told her police except in Gwen's version the roles were completely reversed so it was Gwen that was the weak naive one that was forced to stand in the doorway and keep guard while her evil, malicious girlfriend, Kathy Wood, would wet a washcloth and go up to each of these five victims and smother them to, to death. Literally every single story 
that the two women told were the exact same, details and everything, but their roles were flipped. It was impossible to be able to tell which one of them was telling the truth because after all, it was just the two of them there when each of these murders happened. There was no one else that police could ask. There were no cameras in, in the residential home. And it was more than just the murder stories where the roles were flipped. Gwen was now telling the police that they had this really violent BDSM relationship that she wasn't quite consensual to, but she would do it all anyway to make Kathy happy. She told them the story of how Kathy had inserted a gun into her and threatened to shoot it when it was the other way around in Kathy's version. So we really honestly do not know what their relationship was like. All we have is what they have said and they both say different things. So what is the truth? So I think we can have confidence that each of these individual events happened that they were telling police about but we just don't know who was the main perpetrator or even if there was a main perpetrator. What if they were both just fully in with it together at the same time? I don't know. But at the end of the day, does it entirely matter? I mean, all police know is that they are being told the stories of five murders from two women who are telling the exact same story. Now they can't tell which one had more to do with the murders or whose idea it was. But like I said, does it really matter that much when they have proof that they have two murderers sitting in front of them? Like just, just chuck them both in prison. Just do it. Before they could do anything, the police needed to confirm that those five residents' deaths hadn't been from natural causes. They needed to try to prove that they had been murdered, but this was gonna be very, very hard because they'd all died about a year ago. So all of their funerals had taken place. Like I said, one of them had been cremated literally the day after her death certificate had been signed. So in that case, there wasn't a body at all to look at. Two victims of the lethal lovers had been buried. The other three had been cremated. And so harrowingly, as part of the police investigation, their bodies had to be dug up, exhumed from the ground, taken to a morgue and autopsied over a year on from their deaths. Now, autopsies can be very, very difficult once there's been a great amount of decomposition. I just can't imagine how disturbing this whole process would be for those victims' families to know that their bodies were being dug up out of their resting place to go be cut open. And for those pathologists as well that have to cut open a half decayed human body. Like all of this is just so grim. So in the autopsies of these two bodies, I don't know which victims were actually autopsied, but one of the things that the examiners noticed right off the bat was that, that nothing seemed amiss from the outside. There were no marks, there were no signs of like prolonged abuse or, you know, uh, self-defense injuries or anything of the like. Which makes sense. I mean, Kathy and Gwen would pick their victims intentionally because they were the weaker ones or the f more frail ones, the ones that weren't gonna put up a fight. So it makes sense that there were no self-defense wounds. But finally, when it came to concluding a cause of death for both of these victims, both of them were found to have been suffocated to death. Kathy and Gwen had finally told some level of truth and that was that they were murderers. And this was all the evidence police needed to be able to confirm that. Now they had proof that these two women murdered at least two people, so now they could charge them and send it to trial. There was only one thing left before they could actually send this to trial. They had to figure out who was telling more of the truth than the other? Who was telling a closer version of the truth? Because it was clear that both of these women were liars in some capacity. So there's no doubt that both of their versions of events were sprinkled with lies at the very least, if not all lies. So police really had to do some digging into these women's lives. They had to speak with their families, their friends. They tried to compare as much evidence like uh, witness statements and records and, was just absolutely everything. They were looking into the women's past to see what they'd lied about before, like any violent tendencies that they'd had before. It was a whole operation because 
Honestly, I can't imagine actually how hard of a case this must be for police when you definitely know that these two people were killing together, but they're both telling different stories of it. How are you, How do you tease apart what is a lie and what is the truth? Eventually, police came to a conclusion that Kathy was telling a closer version of the truth than Gwen was. But even then, they don't know to what extent one is lying and one is telling the truth. And of course, they will never be able to be 100% sure on this. It's just based on like little bits of evidence and little, you know, little things, little details here and there. It just seemed that Kathy's version was more truthful. Which meant that she likely had a lesser part in the murders. Still, they can't be 100% sure, but this is what police believe. So following this conclusion that they made, Kathy Wood was actually given a plea deal to give evidence against Gwen Graham at trial. She would get some time knocked off of her sentence, you know, for cooperating. Police knew that it wasn't ideal to give Kathy Wood a reduced sentence because she very much was complicit in these murders and she kept it a secret for over a year, showing lack of remorse. But due to the lack of physical evidence in this case, police knew that in order to actually get this case going and, and have a good chance of getting Gwen in prison, well, a good chance of getting both of them in prison, they needed extra evidence. They needed as much evidence as they can get. And that seemed like it was gonna have to be Kathy Wood standing up there at trial and giving her whole version of events. And the only way to get her to do that is to give her something that she would want. A couple of years off her sentence. I don't know though, it confuses me just personally a little bit that you would trust someone that you've already established as a pathological liar and has lied all the way through this investigation, you're gonna go, okay, now we're gonna go put her on the witness stand and we're gonna believe her now. Like, I know that lying in court is illegal, but like, is that gonna stop her? She's a serial killer. If the law was gonna concern her, it probably would have done it before now. But either way, um, it went ahead. Kathy went and stood up there in trial. She gave every detail that she could and she revealed a lot of disturbing information. And a lot of disturbing information specifically about her relationship with Gwen separate from the serial killings. She described how on the very last night that she saw Gwen when she like packed all the bags and went to move to Texas, Kathy admitted to the court that she physically threatened Gwen's girlfriend, Robin. She said that she was kind of in the headspace of, well, if I can't have Gwen, if Gwen's walking out and leaving me, then then I want other people to be miserable. No one else can have her, da da da. Um, I don't know, that doesn't really explain the logic to me entirely, but Kathy said that throughout the the second half of their relationship, obviously the first half was committing murders, the second half was this weird love triangle with Robin. Um, Kathy said that she would always threaten Gwen throughout that second half uh, with going to the police, with telling the police about their serial killings. Kathy said that she would use this as her main manipulation tactic to get Gwen to do an act as she wanted her to. So once Kathy had finished giving her witness statement in court, Gwen was given a chance to defend herself against it a little bit. So Gwen went and stood up there in court and she said that Kathy had twisted it all and that actually, even though she admitted that she was a little bit abusive towards Kathy, she said that their relationship was mutually abusive. That yes, she had done some horrible things, but Kathy had also done some horrible, horrible things. Gwen said that Kathy would be verbally, physically, sexually, and emotionally abusive to her, just as she would be to Kathy. She said that yes, they had a horrible, toxic, relationship full of different kinds of abuse, but it was mutual. What an incredibly difficult case to try to come to a final conclusion on. I mean, police were already pretty sure of their conclusion before they sent it to trial. They thought that Kathy was telling a closer version of the truth than Gwen was, but even still, it's, it's so difficult that they literally just do not know what happened. It's one woman's word against the others and they're both telling complete opposite tales. I don't know how you actually go about that as like 
a, a, a law official. And that was very much the tone that was set in court, by the way. I mean, obviously, Kathy was giving her plea deal witness testimony thing. So everyone kind of knew that Kathy's version of events should be trusted a bit more than Gwen's. But Gwen's defense team really tried to defend her. <laughs> they said that it was very unlikely that Gwen Graham would have been able to carry out all these five murders, to, to plan them and carry them out and cover them up and keep it a secret for over a year. They said because she had borderline personality disorder and that she was low functioning with her BPD. Which is all, you know, fair enough, but people with BPD don't just go out and commit five murders and keep it a secret and then you go to court and it's like, oh, don't worry, they've got BPD, it's fine. Hello? But anyway, her defence team thought that that defended her. Um, and some other things that they did to try and defend her. <laughs> really liking that word in this video, aren't I? Some other things that they did. They brought in uh, some of the lethal lovers mutual friends, so people that knew them as a couple, and a lot of people did stand in there and say, no, yeah, their relationship was mutually abusive. Like, they were both horrible to each other. But actually, even a couple of their um, co-workers from Alpine Manor, who were brought into court, said that even after Gwen had moved away to Texas at the very end of their relationship, a lot of them said that Kathy stayed very bitter and mean, and she was abusive to co-workers and sometimes even residents. So I guess that says a lot about Kathy's character, doesn't it? That even when Gwen's moved away, she's out of the picture, the two of them aren't together anymore, Kathy is still a foul person to everyone. But ultimately, none of this really changed the case at hand. I think the court had already decided who was telling more of the truth and who was telling less of the truth. So in the end, Gwen Graham was found guilty of all five murders. And for that, she was handed five life sentences. Kathy Wood, on the other hand, was found guilty only of one count of second degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Her plea deal meant that she would only be sentenced to 40 years in prison. I'm just gonna say I'm mad. I'm mad, I don't like that. If she was telling the truth in her story, she stood there and watched as her partner, the woman that she was gonna go and have sex with in an hour, was murdering five elderly people. She kept it a secret. I don't know, one count of second degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Don't sound right to me. I know I'm not a legal professional, but she did more than that. She did more than that. She was very complicit in her part of it in my opinion. So like I said, she was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Um, she became eligible for parole in 2005. And so she applied for it, but she kept getting denied it for a, a while. And then eventually in 2020, the year of the pandemic, she was released, which actually gave me a little bit of a chuckle in my research, I'm not gonna lie. Imagine being in prison like pretty much all your life from your early 20s, you're in there for like, what, 40 years? You feel like so cooped up for so long. And then you get out there into the world and then all of a sudden there's a pandemic and you put on lockdown for two, three years. I don't know, karma, probably. But yeah, like I say, she's out now, so. Gwen Graham is actually still in prison to this day. I don't think she's ever gonna get out. Five life sentences for five murders. No, yeah, no, she's never seen the color of the sky again. The most disturbing part of this whole case to me is that we still don't know what happened. Literally, like, we still don't know what happened. Someone has been in prison and come out of prison and we still don't actually know what happened and we're never gonna because, as I've been saying, it's one woman's word against the other and there's no, like, objective physical evidence that says who did what in each of the murders. Like, we're just, we're never gonna know and I don't like that. There is a reason we only cover solved cases on this channel and that's because I need answers, otherwise it sets my brain on fire and I will be thinking about this for the next week. Both of the women maintain their overall innocence to this day. They both maintain that they were the weaker, naive, easily led one and that their partner was mean and evil and a murderer and that they just kind of stood watch at the door. Only one ears can be telling the truth and even then, what if neither of them are telling the truth? That's an even scarier thought, is that like, what if what if neither of them are even close to the truth and what if it was completely different? 
Oh. Alpine Manor, the residential home itself, has since got a new management and they have changed their name so to distance themselves as much as they possibly can from their tragic, harrowing past. One of the most heartbreaking parts about this whole case that I couldn't get over at any point during my research was that all of these victims had been admitted to Alpine Manor for care. They trusted all of those staff to not only meet all their needs, but to also be caring and kind. And then the fact that those same people could turn and literally murder their patients is horrifying. It's just completely out of the realm of possibility in most people's minds that you could think that someone in a caring profession that has dedicated their lives to looking after people, that has said, yes, this is what I wanna do day in, day out for the rest of my life is look after other people. You could never even imagine that in their head that they're fantasizing about what it might feel like to kill someone and that they could very easily act on it at their workplace. Ugh, it, it really freaks me out. Like angel of death murders like this, where it's like doctors, nurses, those are some of the most horrific to me. That those kind of murderers, they're playing the long game. That they go to school and they get educated and they get degrees. I mean, that's not the case here because they were just nurses aides, but still people like Harold Shipman. I don't know, sorry, I'm going on a tangent, but now I'm thinking about like angel of death killers and I don't know, that's so, that's literally my worst nightmare. But anyway, <laughs> thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. That's all I have for this case, but I do wanna let you guys know actually before I leave that we've just opened up a case request form. The link is down below in the description of this video. So if you wanna suggest any cases for us to cover, if there's any that you particularly want to hear me talk about, go and suggest them. Um, I'm very excited to see all your suggestions. Thanks again to our friends over at Ritual for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you want to get 30% off of your first month, go to ritual.com forward slash 30eneal. The link is also down below in the description of this video if you wanna just go click it. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you wanna watch another one of my videos, I'll leave one right there. Or if you wanna subscribe, click the little circle with my face in. Okay, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.